Talking Goldstein's in. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, first, thank you very much, everybody, for joining today's uh, Bits and Bytes. I'm Sebastian Labrador. I'm going to be introducing two awesome tech heads uh, from Cyber Group, Deeridge and Rocky. Um, they're going to cover the future of client-server communication methods. And the, the, the event today is pretty simple. We're going to cover history and future of communication methods. We're going to have a table talk with some quiz time. Um, so get out your Kahoot apps. Uh, go to kahoot.it. Make sure that you have it in your browser or in your mobile device, um, and you'll be able to interact with us uh, and with the uh, presenters. Um, we're also going to go over the benefits of gRPC and how to choose. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A. Uh, feel free to um, you know, use the Q&A feature within Zoom and also uh, raise your hand and the presenters will uh, get to you in their next uh, available time to answer any questions as, as they feel free to, to do so. Next slide, please, Rocky. Oh, so first, a uh, little bit about our speakers. Deeridge is a principal technologist at Cyber Group and has been with us for 17 years, helping uh, customers with solution architecture, system integration, uh, design, and web technology. Um, and then Rocky has also a principal technologist, and he has eight years of success helping Cyber Group customers within their uh, application architecture, mobile cloud strategy. Um, and uh, delivering numerous uh, projects for us. So welcome both of you. Thank you very much for taking the time out uh, to speak to us today. I'm personally really interested in this subject, uh, but before I hand this off to, to Deeridge, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Bits and Bytes. Bits and Bytes is a tech evangelism program for building community around food and technology. Now we usually do this at Cyber Group, at our Cyber Group offices, and we can't wait to go back, but um, you know, since we live in this COVID world, instead we've chosen to give out some DoorDash gift cards. Um, and so five lucky uh, winners will, will get those DoorDash gift cards. So be sure to participate in our, uh, in our uh, interactive session here. Um, we began this journey last October and today marks our seventh event. Uh, we don't have that October uh, on the timeline here, but <laughs> Uh, there's there's plenty of more events to come, and we've been blowing back, blowing past some of our initial target numbers. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Keep spreading the word. Keep inviting friends to upcoming events. Um, if you know of anybody in your network, uh, invite them, and uh, you know, and they might win some some uh, some free food using uh, DoorDash. So, um, and keep an eye out for our upcoming events on uh, August 27th uh, over data platforms and pipelines. All right, next slide, please. All right, general rules for the session. Um, this is interactive. Again, raise your, use the raise your hand feature in Zoom to ask questions, or you can use the Q&A chat feature. We're gonna be monitoring both. And again, as the presenters have time, they're gonna open it up for questions. Um, and also be prepared with kahoot.it in your browser or on your mobile device. Um, and we'll be able to interact with you guys so that you can win those, those DoorDash gift cards. Next slide, please. All right, so off to you, Deeraj. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Sebastian and Hannah. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks for taking time out to attend this webinar today. Uh, can we move to the next slide, Rocky? So today's webinar is uh, basically divided into four different parts. Uh, one part would be the history of communication methods. Uh, we will go through a brief history of communication methods that have uh, uh, that and what has caused RPC to become a thing of past. We what is the future of communication methods, and we will touch upon HTTP2, protobuf, and gRPC in a little bit of more detail. detail. Uh, so, and uh, last but not the least, how microservice architecture will benefit with gRPC and some of the takeaways from it. Next slide, please. Uh, so before we jump into today's topic, let's take a look at a uh, history of client-server communication methods that we that were introduced in in past few decades. Um, I'm assuming that uh, our audience have members who have lived through these frameworks in past, and some of them not so much. Uh, 
RPC or remote procedure calls have been around since the beginning of, of time. Uh, most of them never copped a speeding ticket. So in the late 90s, uh, XML RPC was introduced and over the period of time, uh, client server communication took shape in forms of XML SOAP, REST HTTP, .NET remoting, uh, until WCF SOAP became a leading standard. Uh, WCF SOAP ruled the rooster for quite some time and became backbone of service-oriented architecture. But like any other technology, uh, this was not perfect and was replaced by REST Open API or Swagger API, as it was called uh, previously in the day. Uh, REST has became the de facto standard, most of us know, for client-server communication. And uh, in the past decade, uh, we a lot of clients and a lot of services are built upon uh, REST, uh, and they are utilizing the power of REST day in and day out. Come 2015, uh, Facebook introduces a new protocol called GraphQL that works on top of the REST API, which gave clients power to structure their data however they want to uh, by issuing calls to server. Uh, and GraphQL uh, has been very successful in doing that. In 2016, uh, Google jumped into the bandwagon with an internal project. Uh, the outcome of this project was GRPC. Uh, a language agnostic, high performing a remote procedure call. Uh, we will learn more about GRPC in uh, coming, coming slides and the foundation technologies upon which it is built. Uh, and today's topic uh, will give us an insight of this technology and where it can possibly be used. Future, like everybody, we are living in exciting times. It has immense possibilities and hopefully a lot of different technologies will pop up in future. Uh, we'll see where grpc uh, goes and how it shapes up so let, uh, uh, before moving further uh, let's get to know uh, my audience uh, for today uh, we will take a quick poll uh, that will give us an idea about what type of communication methods uh, have have been used by our audience over time so if you can go to uh, h to kahoot.it on your web or mobile and uh, in a minute, there would be a pin that will pop up and you'll have to enter your name. Uh, we'll do a quick uh, two question poll. Yeah, please uh, put uh, pin 140360 uh, for, for Kahoot. Uh, and let's see uh, uh, if, we, if we get more participants to join us. Some people coming in fast. Okay. I think people are still joining, so just give them a couple of more seconds. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's uh, start our, our poll for today. So uh, I just want to uh, to know that what my audience have been experiencing in the past. So which of the following client server technologies are most familiar to you? If you look into the screen, uh, it will show four options to you. Uh, red is for RPC and pre-RPC. Rest is blue is for REST API, uh, yellow is for SOAP and WCF, and green for all others. And you can choose as many as is applicable for you. Yes, and this is not, it's not a wrong or right answer. You can choose in as many as you want. There are like 23 more seconds to go. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, wow. Uh, Looks like we have a very mixed audience, uh, mostly concentrated on REST API and SOAP WCF, and I'm not surprised by it. 
uh, REST has been uh, and is a very great uh, communication tool for past decade and WCF was the de facto standard in 2000s. Great. Uh, let's move to the next uh, question. So next question would be uh, a, a question where, where I would like to know that what all common challenges you have experienced with RPC-based client server architecture. You can write anything you want. It, there are no options to this um, question. No answer is wrong answer or just wanted to know what, what are the different pain points uh, you guys uh, have. Also, there was a larger audience for RPC and pre-RPC, so you can also tie for the challenges which you have faced for SOAP and WCF. Twenty-four seconds to go. Last ten seconds. Okay. Various formats, parameter passing, complicated, all point to point, security, difficult, uncaught exceptions, schema change, parameters. Awesome. I see that these answers are very relatable to me. Uh, I have a personal story to share. Uh, way back in uh, mid 2000s, uh, we were developing a Java thick client in Swing uh, that was to be downloaded from a browser. So we were using RPC style of communication uh, from this client uh, to the server. And I remember distinctly that how painful it was to make change and keep up the different versions. Every time we made some changes, the propagation was too difficult. The parameters, if we change the parameter passing was too difficult. But yeah, we'll, we'll look into a little bit more in the next slide that what caused RPC to go extinct, almost extinct, I mean. So, uh, so moving, uh, these are the drawbacks in RPC. Uh, first is marshalling, unmarshalling. Uh, those, uh, for those who are unknown to the concept of marshalling and unmarshalling, uh, it is a process of transforming your data from uh, a client to a server and a server to the client so that it can travel over a, 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 over a communication channel. The order of parameters, the type and the sequence needs to adhere to the version uh, whatever is there on the server, otherwise uh, your calls are bound to fail. Uh, this is very inefficient and it's it's very hard to maintain. So this was the biggest challenge when RPC uh, was being developed, uh, people faced. Uh, second is language dependency. Uh, in, in, in early versions of RPC, um, the client and the server has to be in the same language. They were built for a system and worked really well but with the advent of and accessibility of web increase, people started using multiple programming languages. And since uh, the, not all people had proficiency in the server language and under which the service was written, this clearly became a disadvantage. Uh, lack of streaming. Uh, with web and accessibility of web uh, growing, data streaming became a very important part of client-server communication, whether it was real-time posts or your social networking sites or your movie streaming or visual ads that you see on uh, all of your uh, websites that you go. These all need uh, streaming from server to site and the constant streaming, which, which was uh, exactly a, a, a very pain point uh, to implement in RPC. Versioning, as I said earlier, if from client to client, there are different versions of service, it becomes really hard to manage that which client has been served which version of your code and lack of parallelism. Uh, so RPC forces server to be multi-threaded. Uh, not that we are opposed to concept of multi-threading, but it was an imposition of design in order to achieve parallelism. It was not by default supporting parallelism. You have to be a little bit more to know about how, uh, how to make your code uh, multi-threaded on the server. So, uh we will we will discuss that who came what what happened to uh, rpc and what took uh, rpc over in the next slide next slide please
uh, so rest uh, came to the rescue of rpc style clients so uh, with the with, with a lot of people in audience uh, we know that uh, rest has been very successful a majority of our audience have uh, experienced developed used restful services and rest services uh, in their day to day life and they still use uh, so what are the advantages of rest uh, one is first is that it is resource and uh, content first uh, uh, you do not spend endless time in configuration and calling mechanism but you just focus on your resource and its content uh, the content uh, be it a request or a response is always a human readable content uh, debugging becomes easier and a lot of tools are built around uh, that to maximize this feature um, text uh, heavily leverages http so uh, http protocol in itself has uh, uh, has tremendous uh, benefits it comes out of the box with the default actions like get post put delete uh, and patch which can be easily interpreted to your actions which you want to do on the server. Uh, independence of type of platform or language. REST does not restrict you to use any programming language. You can write your client or server in whatever language you want. You want to write in PHP, Java, Python, Node.js, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core. You are free to use any language to write and consume these APIs. But the only thing that is indispensable is the response to the request should always take place in the language that is used for information exchange. So information exchange language in REST is usually XML or JSON. So uh, let's uh, see uh, in the next slide that how typically um, a REST full API would be called from behind the scenes. Uh, First, we create an HTTP client object. Uh, what you are seeing on the screen is the, a code snippet uh, of how I'm trying to call another microservice from a microservice uh, uh, using uh, my HTTP client in C-sharp. So first, we create an HTTP client object uh, and set the base URL. Uh, in this case, I, I'm trying to call a service hosted on my local host, as you can see. Uh, next, I'm setting the necessary header information uh, in this case, I'm trying to add a bearer token. Uh, I'm, I'm then calling the HTTP get method to get the products from my endpoint. Uh, and uh, I need some mock endpoint for now. But if the server responds with success code, then I'm serializing my response to a certain model that represents my product at client side. And at the end, I'm creating a response and sending it back to the caller. Two interesting things to notice in this snippet, in code snippet, is that I need to use an HTTP client, which is an object to communicate, or a class, or an implementation, which is language specific. Every language would have its own version of a, of a, of a piece of, or a piece of software that would be used to communicate to these RESTful APIs. And second is I'm serializing the response object. The stream that is coming to me is in JSON or XML. I have to march, I have to serialize these into uh, uh, into my uh, C sharp uh, plane objects. So uh, this is how a, a, a code snippet would look like. But behind the scenes, uh, what happens uh, and why REST uh, uh, still is not the best answer. REST has been very successful. Everybody knows that, but there are few pitfalls for sure. Uh, first. Uh, the first pitfall is the textual data interchange uh, is the first topic of rest. Uh, the payload from client to server and the other way around is in text format and which stresses the bandwidth to the T. For example, we know that every Unicode character will be transmitted in two bytes over the pipe. The second is no service contract. Uh, no service contract sometimes is the best thing the rest can have and sometimes the worst thing that uh, uh, REST can have. So it can be a biggest disadvantage with REST. Uh, a lot of client applications uh, want to be certain and act upon the data being received. They, they need to know uh, uh, what is changed, what needs to be called, which type of parameter do I need to send, and they want the programming language to tell them if they are sending something wrong. That means at the compile time, they need to know what they are sending is correct or not. Uh, REST is designed with HTTP 1.x in mind. So what does that mean? That means that every request and response method, every single resource on a web or a client requires an individual request to the server. So if there are multiple requests, 
uh, to the server, uh, the web server or your uh, uh, web servers or servers are, are, are stressed out with the increased load significantly. Uh, HTTP 1.x is also very sensitive to latency. A TCP handshake and a connection needs to be made from the user agent or client to the server for each individual request. That means a large number of requests from your client can take a toll uh, on the server and it can boggle down the server. So for example, look into the, um, uh, the graphic below. So um, on a web page, I'm, I'm using an example where a, a web page is being loaded and, and you will need to have an index.html or a logo and a, and a banner and a CSS and a JS file to render a page in a browser. For each request, there is a request and a response that is being sent to the server and behind the scenes, a TCP connection is being used. And for every request and response, usually a new TCP connection is uh, created. So this, this becomes uh, a problem because it, it becomes a sequential channel between uh, client and server. But wait, you will say that that is not true either. Uh, I use uh, jQuery, um, I use Angular, I use Ajax all the time and I can load multiple resources from my browser all the time. Uh, because the reason behind it is that your, your client is smarter in this case. Your browser is smarter. A browser typically can uh, keep alive six TCP sessions as soon as you reach a web page. But please keep in mind that not all clients are smart enough. There are a bunch of clients who consume these services which are not browsers, which are not very heavy. They are very, they have very basic uh, capability. Uh, like for example, uh, 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 an IoT device on a very low bandwidth would not have a, a Chrome-like browser sitting on top of it trying to send um, uh, data to your server. So uh, behind the scenes, uh, this is what uh, happens. So I'm, I'm ho I hope that uh, I, I have uh, given you enough context. So. Now it's time to play a little quiz. So uh, let's go to Kahoot.it again. So uh, yeah, please uh, use the new pin uh, 419745 and uh, uh, enter in your name to join us in this quiz. It will be a set of four questions, very basic, um, and uh, we will just try to gauge, uh, uh, try to make it a little fun. Okay, I think we have good enough audience to play. So let's go ahead and get started, Rocky. Okay, so question is going to be uh, seen on the screen. Uh, the first question would be that, which is the most used HTTP verb or method today in, in terms of API usages? You have four choices. Uh, one of them is correct. Uh, red is for get, uh, get method, blue is for post, uh, yellow is for put, and green is for delete. Awesome. Looks like most of the audiences know that get is the most popular method. The way you opened Kahoot on your browser right now, you actually used get method to get that data on your browser. Kudos. Uh, next question. Daniel H is leading the chart right now. Yashika is pretty close to her, to him. Okay, next question. Is HTTP protocol secure by default? You have two options. One is true and one is false. Blue is for true and red is for false. Uh, 
uh, HTTP protocol is not secure by default. That's why we use HTTPS. Good job, everybody. I'm dealing with the pros here. Daniel again, uh, Yashika is jumped up and Jeff is just behind. Next question. What is the default information interchange language in WCFSO? So uh, WCFSO, uh, one of another type of communication uh, method, uh, you, does it use JSON protocol buffer, XML or HTML? Good. Nice. I mean, yes, it is XML, uh, and it's a default interchange uh, information interchange language in WCF. So, um, Microsoft Technologies actually made it really popular along with Java in mid 2000s. Uh, a lot of systems still run on WCF. So, yeah, Shika is still leading, I believe. Just Jeff is just after. Next question, please. True or false type of question. Do RESTful API allow clients to dictate the data structure? Either true or false. Do RESTful APIs allow client to dictate the data structures? Cool. Yeah, GraphQL, the technology developed by Facebook actually is used to, uh, that, that allows clients or user agents to dictate that what data they need from the server and majority of our audience know the sensor. Well done. So Sachin is on number three. Daniel H on number two, and we have a winner. Uh, Jeff yeah. is our winner today. Awesome. Good job. Awesome. Okay, uh, so at this point, uh, uh, I would just getting the, the consideration of time, I would take two or three questions if there are any hands raised at the, this point, which have the people who have some question around what the presentation has gone so far. Um, I see there are four questions. And I can we, read the questions. We do have a hand up, um, Satya. And I saw Jay Shah also raised his hand earlier. Okay. Yes, go ahead and unmute Sachin so you can ask his question. Yeah, I'll unmute. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, Sachin, I think you are on, on. You are not muted now. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. So I, I understand the the evolving technology with GRPC, but what really uh, force us or what should really force us to move to the GRPC, the new protocol or the way of communicating uh, to the API from the rest, like rest is doing good. So why moving from rest to GRPC? Exactly. So uh, uh, again, uh, I think uh, you probably are going to get uh, the answer of this question in coming slide because Rocky has done a great job of covering that in the next coming slides. But I will give you a, a high level answer that uh, REST is still very pretty heavy, uh, uh, heavy, uh, heavy in payload, uh, and it needs. Uh, there is a need for uh, something which is faster, more efficient, and which takes lesser time 
to communicate over uh, over the over the channel so we will look into the new technologies like http2 and protobuf that it uses which um, maximizes your throughput and reduces the latency of your um, of your outfit response which which can be mission critical in a lot of applications specifically in a lot of iot devices um, so i hope i answered your question yeah prager is not a silver bullet for everything but yeah it's not a replacement for rest so don't get me wrong it that if we if it looks like that we are trying to replace rest with grpc it's actually not rest would have its own space and grpc will have its own space um, yeah thanks okay all right so this concludes the first part of our webinar uh, so rocky will take over from here uh, the stage is all yours rocky thank you dheeraj uh, it was an insightful history for communication methods i feel i'm very old now uh, looking at all the industry has evolved from rpc to all the way to rest and then grpc which is today's topic uh, and thank you sachin for stealing the thunder for us of the evening uh, but we'll cover that topic and then hopefully that question will be answered in detail so next few slides are talking about grpc and then benefit of grpc and then there will be a small demo for grpc code but before going to the grpc i wanted to talk about two foundation technologies which grpc is built around one is called http2 and then the other one is called protocol buffer so one by one let's talk about what is http2 http2 is um not a ground up rewrite of a protocol it's based on the same http 1.x methods it uses the same status codes just like http 1.x were using it uses the same semantics and all that http 2 was a result of google's internal project called speedy um, the reason they wanted to build a new protocol and we saw earlier http has its own pitfalls and they wanted to build a high performing protocol for communication so the major goal for http2 was focus on performance which we see in this picture here uh, the goal is to allow the use a single connection from client to server it's also called multiplexing in http 1.x every single time you making a call from your client for a resource to server you open a new channel or new tcp connection and it cause a toll on the server side it will be nice if you just open a single connection and then make a request for all your resources using the same connection that way is you save time for opening a new connection and then you know closing that connection so multiplexing help, helps in that way um, same example which we saw earlier um, website is calling some HTML, few graphics, CSS and JS. It's using the same TCP connection to make a request to server. When server receives those requests, they tag those requests with a stream ID so that server knows once server is done processing and they want to give it back to client, they use the same stream ID to communicate back to client. The focus of the protocol was also on performance specifically and user perceived latency network and server resource usages. Um, server push capability is another big benefit of HTTP2, where HTTP2 allows server to respond with a single request coming in and then give you a large number of responses back. So client can make a single request and server knows logically built based on your programming that i need to send seven responses back to your client calling but be mindful this is very tricky um, if in traditional way we know if i receive one request i'm going to give you one response and if you receive one request and you start sending 10 responses they might be lost in the communication because client may not know that they need to handle multiple responses for a single request the other benefit of HTTP was it uses the efficient compression on the header files. It minimized the protocol overhead to improve performance with each browser request and server responses. 
And we were talking about in the quiz that HTTP by default is not secure. HTTP2 made it mandatory that you will have to have your communication secure by default. Uh, HTTP2 inherit the uh, latest TLS version and all your client's library and your client code must adhere to HTTPS, which is port 443 by default. So there were some challenges with HTTP1. HTTP2 is trying to solve those problems and that's what we were talking here. In my next slide, um, the protocol buffer, that's also one of the foundation topic to cover before we talk about gRPC. What is protocol buffer? Or some people call it protocol buffer, some people call it protobuf. Um, it's a way of defining and serializing structured data into an efficient binary format. This was also developed by Google. We all know XML was plain text, JSON was a plain text. However, back in days in SOAP, before so we were using WCF or RPC that used to be a binary communication um, and gRPC uses the same way using protobuf. Now the question is what the heck, why do I need another format? Um, today's days, if we compare how industry has evolved, nowadays we generate thousands of messages among services, not as much as we used to have back in days, so now the requirement is that I need to have a simple method of sending messages, which can handle a large load of network and does not require a lot of resources on the server side. So if we need a fast way to serialize for transforming compact data between services, protocol, protobuf actually helps in that case. Now, People may ask this question, why do I need protobuf? Why can I not use JSON? And I have five good reasons on my screen. Number one, awesome schemas. So the comparison of JSON versus protobuf, JSON, we all know you can have your nodes as you want to define. One node can call it product. The other one can have a spelling mistake of product, but it still looks like same JSON. The result could be it can break your client who's implementing it at the runtime. So schemas are very helpful when you want to enforce your business rules and protocol, proto buff or protocol buffer helps you to define a schema for your business objects. Backward compatibility. This was one of the reason uh, RPC became almost instinct and then you know WCF also caused that problem and we all can connect that why we have a pain for backward compatibility even in the RESTful APIs in JSON if you add a new parameter or if you remove a parameter it always tend to break your existing clients. Protobuf does it a very smart way they use a numbered field by indexing each item or each member in your schema um, and we will see that how that looks, um, but it helps to have a backward and forward compatibility both. So tomorrow, if I wanna add a new parameter, it doesn't require my existing clients to implement the new parameter, which I just added to my schema. Less boilerplate code. Going back to Deeraj's example, we saw every single time you communicate using JSON, you will have to compile and then serialize that object to your client code. So every client must cre create a new model on their side if they wanna use the RESTful APIs. In case of protocol buffer, you can protobuf file can be shared with my client and then protobuf libraries allows you to generate the subclasses automatically for you. So you don't have to worry about writing a new model for your objects. Encoding, decoding is also handled by protobuf. Validation and extensibility. This is very important. In JSON, we missed this. Um, we used to have this type of feature back in days in SOAP where you can compare your XML schema with XSD, but REST didn't have that, JSON didn't have it. There is no way I can define my required field or optional field inside my schema itself. That has to be done on your 
client code or server side code once you receive then you compare and then you validate that requires a lot of you know back and forth coding so there are three different keywords which protobuf provides required optional and repeated keywords they are very extremely powerful language interoperability um, protobuf also implements in a variety of languages which means if i share my protobuf file with one client and then client is building the entire application using java versus the other client is using python same protobuf file will be used and they can generate the protobuf related um, client code using the same file you don't have to change anything in your protobuf file and that's very close to what json used to do json also doesn't require anything to change on your site but protobuf does that too now moving into today's topic before moving to the today's topic let's look at how a protobuf file looks like so i have a screenshot from my code and then that code describes how if you're creating a protobuf file for your grpc code how that's going to look like um, on the top of this screen you see this protobuf file has been used with proto3 which is a new standard newer version of defining protobuf um, you have your package name your service class name uh, inside the service class name you will have multiple methods in this example i'm using two different methods and each method will be prefixed with a keyword called rpc that's the way you define your methods in protobuf schemas and then you will have your um, input parameters and then return return response parameters down below here this is what i was talking about this is my actual schema definition of product um, the data types of each item and then index number. So tomorrow, if I want to add another one product color, I can simply go and say string product color equals to five. Any client which already is using my proto, pro, proto buff file for products schema, they will continue to use it and then their code will not be failing at the compilation time or at the runtime. But if they want to use the new uh, property, which is color, they will implement and then it will work. So that's how the protobuf file looks like. Uh, we will see a little bit more in detail in a few minutes. Let's talk about gRPC. And gRPC is this today's topic. And then we said that the gRPC is built on two foundation technology. It uses HTTP2. It uses protobuf for your schema exchange. Um, but gRPC is also a remote procedure call it's a new way of defining your remote procedure call just like back in days um, it just advanced using newer technology like http2 and protobuf the question is what g stands in grpc there is no um, definition of grpc it was developed by google as an internal project i believe that's why they put g as a prefix it means g remote procedure call the purpose of the gRPC is to build a high performance cross-platform communication method. And that's why gRPC comes into the picture. gRPC also focuses on streaming rather than just focusing on request and response type of client server communication method. So it allows you a unary based communication method where a client is sending a request, server is processing and giving you a response back but the power of grpc comes in the streaming where server side streaming client side streaming or bi-directional streaming can happen good example of server side streaming when my client opens a connection sends a request to server server starts sending a chunk of data back to client and then client receives that data example netflix or video youtube video i open a new youtube link youtube receives the YouTube server receives the request and then they start sending the data in chunks so that I don't have to load the entire three hours long video at once. Client side streaming where client opens a connection to server and then starts sending chunks of data as a stream. A good example is if I need to upload a gigabyte of file to server, I open a connection 
and then start sending chunk of data to server. Server knows this is open connection and I'm receiving a stream from client. They will continue to accept that data in the same channel. Bidirectional streaming, where server and client both has that open connection and they're streaming back to each other. Good example, chat application where the connection is always open and then you're sending responses and requests and messages back and forth. GRPC also focus on the strong typing. Uh, the GRPC service contracts has a strongly typed message that are converted automatically from the proto buffer representation into your programming languages of choice. So example, my server and client doesn't have to be in the same technology, same language. My client can have various type of languages, different client can implement the same um, proto buff and it is still enforces my uh, methods data type to be converted in the strong typing on the client side. Looking at the benefit of gRPC here now, um, we talked about oh, gRPC and then why should I choose gRPC? The gRPC, um, it uses a binary data transfer and header compression. So it gives you a very unique way of uh, communicating very fast and in a compact way. It utilizes HTTP2 for multiplexing over TCP connection. Um, simpler service definition using protobuf. So contract first API development, sometimes it's likable and sometimes it's not likable. Um, if you are a fan of RESTful APIs where I don't want to create any contract between my server and client, we just give you my hell file, look at my hell file, and then see what are the different application parameters which I will be returning it to you. Do that if you want to build a, some, something very robust where you want to share your contract with your client, then Protobuf helps with that. And it is also very language agnostic implementation. Multiple language support, that's um, language agnostic way. Um, faster inter-service communication. There is no need to marshal and unmarshal JSON or XML before and after sending the data. The way we saw in our RESTful API code, every single time you're sending the data to your client, you're converting that data to a stream. And then when you receive it on the client side, you convert that back to your cl class objects. And you don't have to do that all here in uh, gRPC case. GRP handles a lot of networking and serialization for you, which means you will require a lot less code for yourself to write libraries in gRPC. They do that for you. GRPC is good for IoT devices. GRPT, GRPC is good for systems and system integration. Server side asyn asynchronous streaming, reduce wait times to see the first byte of the data. These are the good examples. Here on the screen, if you see, um, I have a diagram, a real time case for using gRPC. If I'm building a microservice type of application and with, among my, uh, microservices, if I wanted to communicate, it's the best way to use gRPC using HTTP2 and protobuf. Um, it's gonna give you better result over REST because of all these benefits here. You can also use gRPC in your native mobile apps. So for example, if I have a native mobile app written in Java and Android, you can use the same protobuf schema and using HTTP2 and call your server side microservices. Going back to this slide here, if you look at this image, the purpose I put this image in, um, conceptually or hypothetically think about Amazon. Amazon starts using drones to deliver packages to everybody's home. Think about how much data they will be communicating back and forth for their map, their you know, order statuses, reaching to right place and then delivering packages. So they, will, they might be delivering packages and sending a lot of communication back and forth to server. And when you have thousands of messages going back and forth from your client device and server, you need a fast and compact way of transferring that data. So gRPC is a good example in that case too. Now, quick demo of gRPC, and then I see some people have raised hand. Um, right after the demo, I'll take those questions. Um, let me share my screen and then show the demo here.
this is a very simple demo I built for today's session. Um, there is nothing fancy in in here. Um, I have a server application written in gRPC. I have a client application written in gRPC. Both of them are in the same solution, but in real world, you will have your server running somewhere else and the client library could be somewhere else. The reason I built this way because I wanted to give a quick preview of how gRPC works. And um, this code will also be available in GitHub for download. And I'll share that link towards the end of this session today. So first thing we want to notice here, there's a protobuf file. So number of protobuf files defines what's your contract between your server and client. This is the same example which I shared earlier on the screen. Um, you have your protobuf defined using proto3. You have your message, two methods, um, one method called get products, it uses a simple way of receiving requests and then returning your response. The second example here called get new products uses product requests, but also if you notice there's a stream method here, stream parameter. So what's gonna happen, I'm gonna show the code and then show you this method when it receives a request, it gives you the large set of data immediately back to you. And the second example is of the server side is streaming where you receive a request on server and you're writing on the stream. So looking at the implementation of this code, this is where we just define the messages in your contract, but actual code will be written in your services. So for example, I created a sample of products. There are only three products in my collection. In real world, that collection of the data will be coming from the database rather than hard coding here. But this product is going to be returned through my get products method. Um, in gRPC method implementation, you use task as your keyword here for your responses. And inside your input parameters, you will have input parameter which you are receiving as a request. Plus you will always have a server call context type of parameters given in here. In this method, simple example, I'm gonna receive a request and then add this collection of products, which is only three in this case, and then return to my client. The second one also has additional parameter called response stream. It's a stream which I'm opening from my server to client, and then I'm writing my data to that stream gradually. I had to put this one second delay so that when I show this demo in run mode, it gives you very clear picture and it refreshes on the screen to showcase that how it looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this code. And if you wanna look at what's in the client side, client side is simple, client side, you're making, you opening a channel, gRPC channel is the way you write your gRPC um, server calls and then you call the actual methods by calling the method name, get product. So this is where it becomes interesting. It feels like these are my local methods now. So get product, because I implemented that product um, protobuf file and it created all the subclasses for my client library. So that way it looks like it's all local methods now for me. However, it's going to this URL to communicate. The first example, I'm taking all the product lists and printing on console. The second one, I'm taking that, moving to the next item coming from a stream, and then I'm printing it on console. I'm gonna go ahead and run this. So when I run this code, um, it's gonna run my server first so that it's open for communication and receiving requests from client. And then it's gonna run my client code. Server is running already and then client's running now. So first method when it calls, if you notice on the screen, boom, I got all the products in once. And in the second case, you notice that data was refreshing because my server is writing on the stream gradually. Example was simple, there were only three items. If I had 30,000 items, then it would have made more sense that I can send 10 items every single time my client requires. So that's all I had for the demo. We're going back to um, presentation again. 
Let me take some of the question. I see a lot of um, raises hand here. So nobody has raised hand. I see questions. All of them are in Q and A, Rocky. Yeah. In the Q and A panel. Right. Uh, I'm taking that question here, which says, "Are schema validation uh, in RPC in gRPC same as SOAP and WSDL?" The short answer is yes. Um, the difference is in SOAP WSDL, you have your DSL generated through your WSDL file and your schema is always validated against your the WSDL DSL file. In case of gRPC, gRPC also creates your stub classes. So the validation is happening against the stub classes which are generated on your client side. The next question here, um, it's gRPC also TCP IP based. The short answer is yes, because it uses the HTTP behind the scene, although it uses HTTP2, but it still uses the TCP IP communication. All right, I'm going to go back to this uh, content now, and then we'll come back and then take rest of the questions. All right. So we looked at the gRPC, we looked at the HTTP2, we looked at the protobuf, we looked at, we talked about the benefits. But questions, do you think the gRPC is perfect? Obviously gRPC is not perfect. We do not want to say here that gRPC is a silver bullet and such in that might cover some of your question which you were trying to ask earlier. Um, gRPC is not meant for everything. The reason gRPC is not meant for everything because protobuf schema requirement becomes a, a very hard need Sometimes you do not want to share your schema and you know you want just a schema less type of architecture, just like your REST APIs, where you share your help file or implementation guidelines with your client and they look at the JSON implementation and they build that. GRPC doesn't do that. They have a strict requirement for protobuf. The big problem with GRPC as today um, gRPC currently is not supported for browser-based application. So there is no direct way for me to call from my client libraries using HTTP2 to a gRPC service. There is no native browser support um, default, but they, it, it, and I'm talking about today, people are still in development. I'm pretty sure soon uh, React Angular, Node, they will all have the gRPC kind of library built for you. Today, if you wanna use gRPC in your web application, there is a thing called gRPC web or gRPC proxy. That's the way you can use gRPC in your web application. So back to my uh, example, microservices are communicating among themselves using gRPC, but then if your web application wants to call any method of your microservice or API, they will have to use gRPC proxy in order to communicate. And when they are using that, it might, your, based on your library, they may still be using HTTP 1.x, and then they may be using protobuf, and then proxy will be translating that 1.x conversion to HTTP2. Um, the other problem with gRPC, it's so young and there's some very limited support available in the market. So if you are looking for a large tool set for debugging, for testing, a lot of work is still in progress. If you think about Postman, Postman was an awesome tool for any developer. When you're building your REST API, you can open Postman for your debugging, your, for your validation, for your unit testing. There are tools like Postman for gRPC are still work in progress. There are some available, but they are not as good as Postman. Um, so in this table down here, um, if we look at four different type of communication method which gRPC offers, unity, uh, server-side streaming, client-side streaming, and bidirectional, any thick client, for example, your microservice which is running behind the scene or your mobile app or your Windows app, they can support all four types right now. In case of web, 
the only support even using the gRPC proxy, the only support available for your unary and server side streaming. There's no support for client side streaming and bi-directional streaming as today. All right, now a million dollar question. If I am building or my client has given me a project to build my next microservice based architecture or a service oriented architecture, how do I choose that should me, should my next application be a RESTful or should it be a gRPC based? So gRPC is again, not a silver bullet. There are some challenges with gRPC. So when it comes to a question of choosing the right architecture um, on my screen, you can see REST APIs are awesome and then good for correct type of operation. So simple example, if you are building an e-commerce application where you will make updates to the database for your um, objects, just go with REST APIs, they're perfect. You would not worry about you know, implementing or using gRPC proxy in that case. GS, gRPC on the other side is good for many other things like synchronous, synchronous high throughput communication among inter-service microservice um, using strong core contract. What does it mean? So if I'm building a microservice architecture and I want to use the communication among microservices, which is not facing my client, client doesn't know how you're communicating among your microservices, and you want a strong contract business rule in, enforced type of high throughput and synchronous communication happening, use gRPC for that. gRPC is also good when your code is written for a polyglot environment where every service I'm talking to Salesforce, I'm talking to um, Amazon service behind the scenes. So there are multiple languages, multiple platform in, in, involved and I can use um, gRPC in that case where the code will be generated using my stub classes and a protobuf file and then it's good in that case. Point-to-point -point real time communication for bi-directional streaming. This is a very good example where if I want to build something and I want to communicate between client and server continuously without always opening a new TCP connection, think about using gRPC. It's a better way of building your new application rather than going for RESTful. Um, lightweight message format allows it to be used in a network constraint environment. So because the, the binary data compact data is transferred among the gRPC server and client. So if you are building something which is gonna be your mobile app running on um, low bandwidth 3G environment, gRPC is a better way for doing that because it's going to exchange data in a light way. It's used in lightweight message format. Um, so I hope that answers some of your questions, um, Sachin, and then other people who were thinking about, oh, why do I need another format? Why should I um, you know, think about gRPC and how do I choose? This slide covers that. Um, this is where I will conclude uh, for gRPC's topic. Um, today's session is also recorded and it's uploaded on Cyber Group YouTube channel. On this slide, I am also showing multiple useful links and this, these all links will be available in the description of that YouTube channel. So the first link here is uh, an awesome gRPC tool. gRPC community, as I said, it's a still work in progress. They have done a great job building a, a, a place where if you're building a new debugging tool or testing tool, put in under awesome gRPC GitHub link. So if you go to this link, there are many tools for yours need. They're available in for different type of languages for Go, for Python, for uh, .NET and all that, everything is available in there here. Some of us may be wondering um, to talk about the performance differences. With the limitation of the time of today's session, I had to put these two links here. If you go in and look at these links, they are talking about the comparison of RESTful versus gRPC performances. Um, so they, these two are very good articles. Go and then check it out when you get a chance. 
gRPC is also supported by .NET Core 3.1 recently. So .NET, 3, uh, .NET Core 3.1 type of application, if you're building that, you wanna look at it, how the gRPC support is provided, the link is available here. Today's code snippets and then demo all is available for us to download at GitHub. The links are available here. Um, the next item here talks about the early adopters of gRPC. I'm pretty sure Google is one of them because Google had that as an internal project. So I don't know under the hood if Google Maps or YouTube both or you know many other Google products uses gRPC. I'm pretty sure some of them for sure uses them. Um, Netflix was an early adopter of gRPC. Um, if you're watching Netflix, you may not even notice that how much data you download every single time you play a video. gRPC is helping Netflix for achieving that. Square, which is a payment gateway, they use gRPC for their internal microservice communication. Wisconsin University, it's interesting one um, because they're using an open Lambda research product project in, um, in the university and they're using gRPC for that. Cock Cockroach Labs, um, they are a, a database company. Um, very interestingly, they had their own, own homegrown RPC version in the beginning for communication. And once gRPC became popular, they gave up on their homegrown RPC system and then they adopted gRPC now. So that's all that. And um, Dheeraj in the very first slide talked about future is beyond possibilities. So the two bulleted points, which I am showing on this slide, what is future looks like? I heard HTTP3 is coming up. They, it's in development and many um, client libraries are starting to play around with HTTP3. It's gonna be built on a protocol called Quick. It's a UDP type of, communication method rather than TCP type of communication method, which means the client server communication may not be a client server communication no more. Every system can serve as a server and client server may be called as server server in future. With that, I thanks everybody. And then now we are open for questions. All right, uh, so we are over on time. But so those of you who don't have questions, feel free to drop. And uh, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to, to stay on. We'll answer as many as we can. Uh, I just want to thank all of you who uh, do decide to drop uh, for coming to our event. Um, and uh, you'll be receiving, um, or five lucky winners will be receiving an email from Cyber Group uh, for the DoorDash gift cards. So let's go ahead and uh, stick around for a little bit um, if you want to get some questions answered while we have our uh, speakers here. It looks like we have a bunch of questions in the queue. Yeah. Rocky, so if you want to. So let's you know, start with the pick. first one. All right. So the first question here says Is gRPC becoming more useful in the world of microservice and containers? The short answer is yes. If you are building a microservice or container based architecture, gRPC is definitely going to help you out for a faster and compact way of communication of data exchange um, for your services. And also in the link section, there is another uh, good article which says why millisecond is important. Uh, the whole process of saving a millisecond on a server on a call or a maybe half a millisecond on a call can produce drastic uh, throughput from the server. It can handle more requests uh, at the same time. And gRPC, the biggest advantage is uh, the efficiency and the speed that is that it provides. So definitely in the containerized world, uh, it is going to uh, play a bigger role. Cool. Right, so moving to the next question, what does the Marshall unmarshall, where does the Marshall unmarshall happens in gRPC? So marshalling and unmarshalling does not happen in gRPC because the code is generated by your stub classes. And when you receive a request, the marshalling and unmarshalling will be done in those stub classes for you. And you don't have to write any code, it's already written. So next is one more of a comment than a question. Yeah, um, Jesha said um, one of the other great 
example is grpc is used in kubernetes ingress control um, thank you jay for um, telling us um, gcp or alibaba cloud in in your cluster so thanks thanks jay what is the what are configuration uh, it's what are configuration add-on packages requires to support grpc on windows server and or mobile app so the answer of this if i understand the question um, are you asking what type of packages do you need to install to support grpc if you are writing a windows server code or mobile app code if that's the question the answer is every type of language and client libraries which supports grpc today they have grpc client libraries so example dotnet core 3.1 has support for uh, grpc client libraries and you will have to add the grpc client library inside your code in order to use grpc methods and the good part about all these client libraries is that they are developed by a single source it's not like every uh, every uh, language is trying to implement their own version they are centralized so it is pretty much standard that if it is working on a platform it is going to work on another platform uh, and uh, these client libraries are freely available on github uh, i believe there must be a link in our in our uh, yeah. about that um, next question Kaushik is asking, will this presentation be shared? Yes, uh, the presentation will be, um, the, the session is recorded and then uploaded to YouTube and then um, we'll reach out to Hannah if you need the presentation as well. We can share that. Advantage of GRPC over socket IO or web sockets? So, um, so very interesting question. So yeah. web sockets basically are um, basically software sockets. So they are on top of, they're not really hardware sockets. So they still are on supported on HTTP 1.1. And the biggest advantage GRPC has that it's supported on um, uh, HTTP 2. Uh, the speed, the efficiency, uh, and uh, the marshalling of the data. These are the three things that, that takes GRPC uh, much in a much better position than sockets or web sockets currently. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure that if, if somebody tries to get a matrix of uh, same calls on web sockets uh, over GRPC, uh, GRPC would go ahead leaps and bounds. Yeah, and then the second advantage is socket IO and then web sockets there is still on HTTP 1.x protocol. So GRPC helps you if you want to use the better, you know, HTTP 2 type of protocol. Um, the last question here, it says, can you hybrid RESTful API to a gateway and then use gRPC for the inter, internal microser microservices call? Yes, you can do a hybrid mix and match. You can have multiple types of implementation of your methods and exposing that methods for your client. But be mindful what you're trying to serve. If you do a hybrid type of approach, and let's say I'm trying to do a high availability type of environment where the code is running on multiple servers behind the load balancer. Now load balancer is dependent on a specific type of protocol support. So now I don't know what my load balancer should support. Should it support HTTP 1.x or HTTP 2? If you use HTTP 1.x, then you're losing the benefit of using gRPC behind the scene because it's going to translate your request to HTTP 1.x and then HTTP 1.x will be converted from HTTP 2 and then you lost the benefit of HTTP 2 in that case. So hybrid is possible, but it's also very subjective how you want to implement that, but it's possible. Right, I think that was the last question here. Yeah. Awesome, thank you very much guys. Here, can you go to the last slide real quick? Yeah. For those of you still on, um, again, thank you very much for attending and staying with us uh, this far. This is, a, this is an interesting, event um you know client server architecture um and communication methods been going on for a long time and it's just really cool to see a different perspective today so thank you very much Deeridge and rocky for sharing us your 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 passion and uh you know we look forward to having you guys speak at future events as well 
Um, for upcoming events, please go to Cyber Group Bits and Bytes on our meetup.com website. Um, and or you can go to our uh, cygrp.com site uh, and uh, check us out and, and learn more. Um, now for the winners, again, you'll receive uh, an email from Cyber Group uh, for your DoorDash gift card. So uh, if you guys want to stay in touch and, and get in contact with Deeridge and Rocky, here's our contact information. Um, and, you know, you can take a screenshot of this and we can, or we can just post this in the chat for you um, and uh, look out for that here soon. But th again, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining. And we'll see you at the next Bits and Bytes. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. And I'm Sebastian for organizing this, too. Yeah, thanks, Sebastian. Uh -huh. All right, bye-bye.